Hello, I'm Tom Rothman of 20th Century Fox. Welcome to Fox Legacy. We're glad to have you with us. I love you, Sylvian. The way you walk, the way you talk, everything about you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, love is a many splendored thing. They, which means we, don't make them like that anymore, so the saying goes, and that's true, literally as well as figuratively. It's true both in terms of the content of the film and of how it was actually created. Love is a Many Splendored Thing is a grandly old-fashioned film, even as it dealt with a modern racial issue. You see, today, we don't build sexual tension slowly through a dozen separate scenes before even the first chaste kiss. We don't drape a film in a lush song score repeated over and over. We don't cast a girl from Tulsa, Oklahoma as a Eurasian doctor, and we sure as hell don't have the characters light cigarettes in a gratuitous bathing suit scene to symbolize the consummation of their relationship. Okay, well, all right, maybe we do do that sometimes, but we shouldn't. And beyond its unabashed, old-school, post-war, exotic locale romance, love is a many splendored thing is also a great example of another lost culture, the now-defunct studio system for making movies. From the early days of movie making and all the way into the 1950s, studios ran very differently than they do today. Back then, pretty much everyone was under a long-term employment contract directly with the studios. Actors, directors, writers, producers, the ladies and gentlemen I see around here. When people talk about how brilliant the brilliant Irving Thalberg was, the man who had my job at MGM, who accomplished more than I ever will, and who, when he was my age, had already been dead for 20 years, I think to myself, yeah, yeah, Thalberg, but, you know, everybody worked for him. How hard was it? I, mean, I have that dream sometimes. I call up Tom Hanks, and I tell him which of our movies he's going to do on Monday. Then, unfortunately, I wake up, I come to work for real. But before the mid-50s, the studio did essentially control the talent careers, often with an iron fist. What would Shirley Temple's next movie be? You had to ask then Fox studio head Daryl Zanuck, who owned her contract. If another studio wanted to borrow Shirley's services, as when MGM wanted her to play a certain little girl from Kansas, it was up to Zanuck to decide if he would lend her out or not, and clearly he didn't. And if not controlled with an iron fist, Perhaps they were controlled with the hand of poker. You see, the stories may or may not be apocryphal of Louis B. Mayer, Sam Goldwyn, and others of the era sitting around a card table with actors' contracts as ante. But in truth, the studio system was a two-edged sword for talent. On the plus side, they had something far from guaranteed today, steady employment, and a very clear path to success if you had the talent to back it up start out as a contract dancer like, say, Rita Hayworth and work your way up. Studios also, by the way, got to pick your name. Rita started as Margarita Carmen Cancino, then Rita Cancino. Uh, I have the document actually changing her name, hanging in my office. And then finally Rita Hayworth. Jennifer Jones began as Phyllis Lee Isley. Today, I I'm lucky if I get a vote in my own kids' names. But whether Rita, Jennifer, or Marilyn, you could work your way up from bit parts, and then eventually the studio would give you a media role to prove whether you've really got star potential. Many careers were nurtured and created that way. But on the negative side, if you wanted your career to move in a different direction, you may have had to wait out your contract to get that chance and avoiding typecasting was almost impossible. Today, only great material, other talent, and money compel people to join films. Every single individual on our sets, from the star to the stagehand, is a free agent. Back then, it was easier to be a studio executive. You went down your roster of directors, you picked the writer from your pool, you assigned your lean actors, and you had a movie. Love is a Many Splendored Thing came together in just that fashion. The movie started as a very successful novel by Dr. Elizabeth Comber, 
Comber was of mixed heritage, born from a Chinese father and a Belgian mother. She wrote about her own real-life love affair with a then-married war correspondent. It's two star-crossed lovers from different cultures fall in love. He's married and they face the challenges of war, race relations, and conservative morality. Using the pen name of Han Su Yin, also the name of the female lead, A Many Splendored Thing, was published in 1942 and became an international bestseller. The love part of the title, by the way, was added later for the movie. Now, a novel this successful, then or today, catches the attention from every studio in town, and there was a bidding war. Ultimately, Fox won out thanks to a young man named David Brown, then a story editor. Now, Mr. Brown would go on to legendary success, and he's still going today. Zanuck assigned producer Buddy Adler, who had produced a little romantic movie in 1953 called From Here to Eternity. For the director, Henry King was actually under contract at Fox. Now, that's kind of like saying, hey, we have Sidney Pollack or Ang Lee or Baz Luhrmann under contract, let's assign him to direct this movie. King was a giant, having directed dozens of successful movies in over a 40-year career. And indeed, he directed eight different acting performances that went on to be Oscar-nominated, and three of those performers won Academy Awards, including the star of this film, Jennifer Jones herself. King had directed Jones in The Song of Bernadette for Fox, and the accolades cemented her as one of the most bankable actresses of her era. Now, Jones had a three-picture deal with Fox, but in fact, her career was actually controlled by her husband, the infamous producer David O. Selznick of Gone with the Wind fame. They had met when both were married to other people, but ultimately, after a very famous love affair, they got divorced from their spouses and married each other. See, I guess that part of the system remained somewhat the same. Selznick was not officially involved in the picture as a producer, but he was famous for sending memos to Fox executives and to director Henry King. He didn't like her hair, he didn't like her accent, he didn't like her costumes, and he sure as hell did not like her leading man, who was rather notorious for having love affairs with all of his leading ladies. William Holden, fresh off a best acting Oscar for Stalag 17, had wanted the rights to the novel for himself. He'd had his contract studio, Paramount, try to buy the rights, but Fox outbid him. Holden was ultimately loaned by Paramount to Fox for the role. There was, in the end, backstage drama, but not the kind that Selznick feared. When Jones and Holden didn't see eye to eye, she would complain to her husband. And as you can imagine, eventually, or rather very quickly, the two stars weren't even talking to each other, except on screen. I've often thought that lovers are more convincing on screen when the actors actually don't like each other than when they do. And that certainly was the case here. Legend has it that Jones actually ate garlic cloves before kissing scenes with Holden to make it deeply unpleasant for him. And yet, they burn the screen up. Even the music itself illustrates the studio system. The Oscar-winning score was by the legendary Alfred Newman, who received 40 five Oscar nominations throughout his career and won nine of them, a record that held until John Williams surpassed him in 2006. Newman was also a Fox employee. Indeed, we still score our films today next door in a recording studio called the Newman Stage. And because Newman was a contract employee, he produced and Fox owns what is surely the most famous tune ever associated with the movies. Music that still plays before every single Fox film everywhere in the world. Could Alfred have imagined what a ringtone download was? That is the Fox fanfare. And by the way, it really is my ringtone. My dedication knows no bounds. It too like so much of the irreplaceable history of Hollywood, is a product of the studio system. What happened to that system? And is the audience better or worse off without it? I'll give you my two cents on all that after the movie. There's an old Chinese proverb. Do not wake a sleeping tiger. In the meantime, relax and revel 
in the romance that that system could create. And guys, do be careful of waking the sleeping tiger. Hey, toughen up. Mark Elliott may have died, but his spirit lives on. And Han Su Yin is a better woman for having loved him. I guess it is true. We really don't make movies like that one anymore. I promised you I would tell you what happened to the studio system that produced such films. Well, the answer is many things, but chief among them was World War II. When Americans came back from the war, and the great economic engine that had fed it roared into the second half of the 20th century, powerful talent was no longer content to be owned. Contract player Olivia de Havilland refused to do a film for Warner Brothers, and when the courts declared her agreement involuntary servitude, tough servitude, it opened the door for other stars to break their contracts and pursue more lucrative deals. Jimmy Stewart, Clark Gable, Burt Lancaster, and others embraced freelance status, becoming quickly among the highest paid actors and undermining the studio system at the same time. From the actors followed the directors and the writers and so on and so on. Liberation, unionization, freedom, and risk. Now I dispute the many who say that the movies were better overall then than now. In true fact, some were better and some were not. So many more films were made then that they could support a studio system. In 1948, the major studios made around 500 films. In 2007, the six majors made only 150. Time has the selective effect of washing away all the forgettable ones and leaving us with just the greats. With the advent of television and the breakup of the vertical integration of the studios, maintaining that quantity became impossible. But a democratization of the process also leads to an expansion of creativity. So, my life would have been easier and maybe even glamorous. But I can't imagine that the movies themselves would ever have remained as vibrant, evolving, inventive, and alive as they have been these 50 years had the system itself not died. But I can still have that Thalberg dream every once in a while, can I? Bogey. Listen, I've got some bad news. I was playing poker last night. Oh, and then, yeah, your contract. Well, what can I tell you, man? You got to go to work on Monday. I know, it's a bitch.